invite you all to stand if you want to and praise the Lord with us this morning. We're happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning.
reason to praise Him this morning because God is faithful in every situation and every season. Amen? Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise this morning. God is good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We want to go to the Lord in prayer and open up this service today. We want to just take all the requests that, that are present here in this house this morning. We want to take them and lay them at the Lord's feet. Uh, there isn't anything God can't do. Uh, the Bible says, is there anything too hard for God? And the answer to that is a very resounding no. There is nothing that is impossible as long as God has his hand in it. Amen? Amen. Um, do want to request special prayer. Continue to pray for uh, David Deese, um, his recovery. Uh, just want to ask, it, you know, that family's been through so, so much the last few years. And uh, we just want to lift them up in prayer and ask that God would continue to minister to them. We want to pray for, like I said, every need that's in this house today. If you're here and you need something from God, we serve a God who answers prayer. Amen. We serve a God who brought us out of the darkest of darks and, and the, the deepest of depths. We serve a God that can do anything that we would ask if we just believe. Amen. Amen. Do you believe that God can do something powerful in the house today? Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for your, your presence in this house today. We thank you, Lord God, for your blessings, the opportunity that you've given us to come into your house, your presence, to lift you up and give you the praise, honor, and glory that you deserve, God. We just ask today that you would minister to every heart in this house, Lord God. Stir our souls to the very deepest, darkest parts of us, Lord God. Shake our foundations and help us, Lord God, to have a desire to serve you and to draw close to you, God. I pray pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, for every uh, heart that's in this place this morning, for every need that may be here, Lord God, that you would meet those needs, that you would minister to every individual, God, that you would be with the Dees family and continue to lift them up and strengthen them. God, let your spirit go forth. Let your anointing accomplish its purpose in this service and in our lives today. God, we, we thank you. We give you praise, honor, and glory in all things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Can we give the Lord some more praise this morning? Hallelujah. God is good. Why don't we take a moment to step across the aisle and greet one another in the name of the Lord.
some announcements here. Uh, there's a mistake in the bulletin. It says Thursday, July 25th that the King's Closet will be open. Uh, the King's Closet is going to be closed. 
and it won't be open again until the back to school bash next Sunday the 28th. Uh, the, July the 24th through the 26th is the Brave Women's Conference at First Pentecostal Church of Pensacola. And on Friday, July 26th, the youth will meet at the church and travel to the youth revival at My Father's Arrow. The speaker will be Zach Carnley. On Saturday, the 27th, from 9 to 11 a.m., the master's table will be open, our food giveaway. I ask that every, anybody that wants to help and can help be there for that. And Sunday, July the 28th, is our big back-to-school bash. It's at the Family Life Center. There will be volleyball, basketball, water slides, food and ice cream, and free school supplies, at least while they last. We ask that the kids bring appropriate swimsuits and towels, but this should be a good, that should be a good time. On Saturday the 27th, there will be a meeting at 5 o'clock to prepare for the back-to-school bash. We'll be cleaning up and getting, getting ready for that. So anybody that can come out and help us do that, It'll be at 5 o'clock in the Family Life Center back here. On Saturday, August 3rd, is our normal men's breakfast and Bible study. Also on that same morning, the women will be gathering for a light breakfast and a Bible study. I look forward to seeing you all there. Uh, would the ushers come, please come and collect morning tithes and offerings, please? Brother Kel, will you pray over the offering?
Sit down, Joey. I ain't gonna sing. You ain't gotta leave. I get the privilege today of introducing a special guest, but before I do, uh, I want to say a few words. Um, some years ago, uh, we went to a little church up the road, uh, Roundsville Baptist Church, and our guest today, his, his father preached there. Uh, Mr. Brother Kale. And y'all have heard a lot about David David Kale, our brother who goes to church here. Um, his family, if you'll look in the middle rows today, 
you'll see the Kells. And you'll see a few extra guests. Uh, Brother M. Finger's here today. I'm glad to see Brother M. Finger. Um, but Brother Kell was a, a man of God. And I'm talking about their dad. And I called him Brother Kell. Mr. Kell. Uh, I sat under him as a pastor years ago, and he, he was a man of God. He preached there years before I ever went to that church as a pastor. He held that church as a pastor. And many times I got to listen to him. Uh, he sat in as an interim pastor. Great guy. Man of God. Um, and this family is, is serves God great. And I got to sit uh, Friday and spend some time with Brother Greg and and David and listen to Greg talk about his servant of God and him surrendering God and surrendering God and uh, pastoring at, at up the road. Actually, first church I think you served at was New Bethel. Is that correct? And uh, so he served in our community. But anyway, uh, without further ado, um, I'm excited today to, to hear him preach and um, I know his heart. I, I'm excited to hear him today, and, and I want to introduce him and make him welcome, y'all. Um, I'm excited to hear what he's got to say. Just bring us the Word of God, brother. Well, thank you so much for the chance to be here. I uh, don't believe everything that my brother David might have told you about me. He hadn't been known to lie, but he's been known to talk for a long time before. So, um, I was born when my father was a pastor at Pine Level. So I was born in a peanut field. And then my first pastor, 28 years later, was at New Bethel in the cotton field. Um, so I'm a North Santa Rosa County boy originally raised most of my life in Milton. As an adult, I have only lived in two states, Florida and Alaska, and nowhere in between. But in my young years, I worked for an oil company, and um, that took us up to Alaska. And my wife, Darla, is here with me. And at that time, we had a one-year-old daughter. And we took her and went to Alaska, which was very unpopular with grandparents. Um, built a home and lived up in the Wasilla area, and I worked at Prudhoe Bay. Uh, God bless those years. And I surrendered to the ministry while we were living and serving in Alaska at Big Lake Baptist Church. And I um, still love that church. God brought us back here. I spent 34 years in ministry. Started at New Bethel. David and Renita Enfinger are here. David Enfinger was the first person I ever baptized as a pastor. And uh, so obviously, David and Renita hold a special place in my heart. I'm hoping to redeem myself, David, because I didn't know it then, but I spent a little over four years as pastor at New Bethel. When you're raised a preacher's kid, you know, I was, just, I was called there as pastor, but I had no idea what a pastor was supposed to do. And they just assumed that because I was raised a preacher's kid that I knew exactly what a pastor was supposed to do and that I knew how to do it. But I got my check the first week. The first week I walked in, and the first person I met there that morning was Renita's mother. And she said, asked me, Pastor, where are the bullets? And I said, Miss Margaret, I don't know where the bulletins are at. Where are the bulletins normally at? She said, they're normally on that table right there in the vestibule. And they're not there. I said, okay. Who normally brings them and puts them on that table? She said, the pastor does. I said, okay, where does the pastor get them? The pastor makes them. He types them up, puts them on the mimeograph machine. Remember those days? And he folds them, 
And he brings them, and the pastor is responsible for the bulletin. And I'm thinking to myself, we're not getting off to a good start here. I said, Miss Margaret, we're not going to have a bulletin today. And uh, she gave me that side eye. But eventually I won her over. And so, David, I look back years later and thought, because I have a videotape, an old VCR tape, of one of my sermons at New Bethel. And I sat down one day to watch it. I grabbed my notepad and I thought, I'm going to take notes. I'm going to get a new sermon out of this. And I sat there and watched that tape for 30 minutes, listened to that preacher preach for 30 solid minutes. You know how many pages of notes I took? None. And I thought, that was awful. And you guys endured a little over four years of awful and never told me how bad I was. But um, God's really blessed us. We spent 34 years of ministry. Uh, I retired in March of 2020 and uh, am doing now uh, working for a national ministry that does personal finance. And I also do some leadership training and development myself. But uh, my wife is with me. Uh, Darla, if we make it another month, we'll be married 46 years. Um, and we have a dear friend with us today, Trish Pullman. Um, I, I, I hesitate to say how long we've been friends, Trish. But it's been more than 40 years. And um, so her and Darla are sitting there the morning almost 20 years ago now that Darla's father passed away. Uh, we got called from the hospital at a little after 2 in the morning, got up, started getting dressed to go back to the hospital. And while we're getting dressed, my cell phone rings, and it's Trish, and her father had just passed away as well. They, Their dads literally passed away about 20 minutes apart. So um, I buried Trish's ma, uh, dad on Monday and buried Darla's dad on Tuesday. And uh, not only did I bury Trisha's dad on Monday, but then she, because this is what real friends do, in her grief, she came to Darla's dad's funeral the next day. So this is about the closest thing I've ever had to a sister. Uh, she's a lot older than me. <laughs> but I'm so grateful, Trish, that you're here today. Um. I want you to turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to be in Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3. We're going to go right back to the basics. And I know a lot of you in these modern days have the Bible on your phone or your iPad or whatever, and that's great. But just always take your Bible to church in whatever form. Even if they put all the Scripture on the screens. Still, you ought to take your Bible to church. You say, why? I don't know. It's just the way I was raised. I just think there's something about having God's Word in your hand. This morning, I want to talk to you about a subject I've never really preached on, not in this context. I have talked, used this, some of this teaching and counseling for many years. But I've never preached it in a congregational setting. But I'm excited to do that. But I want to kind of tell you up front that it's going to be very personal. Not personal about me, but it's going to be very personal to you. And I want you to hang with me and not be afraid of that. Starting in Genesis chapter 2, I'll start in verse 15. Here's the context. Genesis chapter 1 gives kind of a broad overview, a broad brushstroke of creation. Genesis chapter 2 comes back and adds more detail to that. So Genesis 1 and 2 are the creation story. Genesis chapter 3 is where Satan enters the garden and tempts the woman. who She didn't have a name at that point. She was just woman. Tempts her. And she partakes of the forbidden fruit and then gives it to her husband, and sin enters God's creation. 
That's the context we're going to we're going to be in today. It's Genesis chapter two, Genesis chapter three, Genesis two, beginning in verse fifteen. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou castest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Eatest thereof. And the Lord said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help me for him. Now let me pause real quick. At this point, Adam was in the garden, and he had three things that, that every man should have. Adam had a place to live. Adam had a job to do. And Adam had a relationship with God. You with me? He had a place to live, a job to do, and a relationship with God. If you had asked Adam, Adam, what else do you need? He would have probably said, nothing. I have everything I need. It wasn't Adam. It was God that said, it's not good for him to be alone. Translation, he can, he can do his job serve and relate to me even better if he's got a helper. It's got to be the right helper. A helper just for him. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help meet for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. He took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, or for that reason, shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Again, let me pause. Did you catch that? They shall be one what? Flesh. How in the world could they be one flesh? Because they were both divinely created. They shouldn't just be one that gets along. They shouldn't just be one in spirit, as we sometimes say. He said they should be of one flesh, uniquely tied together. Verse 25, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, seems pretty obvious, right? And we're not ashamed. It's interesting to note that the word shame is mentioned in Scripture before sin ever entered God's creation. Why in the world would the Holy Spirit inspire Moses to write they were not ashamed look back in verse 25 and you see the key word here naked they were both naked you're going to find out this morning as we walk through that of course refers to a physical nakedness but it is way deeper than that in fact I hope as you read and study scripture you'll realize that Scripture is often way deeper than what it just appears on the surface. If it was just physical nakedness referred to there in verse 25, you would have said, duh. Of course they're naked. 
But it was much more than that. It's, it's an interesting thought. It's hard for us to comprehend what we see here in chapter 2. Adam and Eve are living in an amazing place. I would submit to you a perfect place. Let me tell you, try to imagine this with, with me. You can't, but try. This place they lived in is a place where there is no temptation. There's no aches and pains. Any of you got a, can I get a witness there? There's no death. There's no grief. There's no sorrow. There's no comparison. There's no politics. And there's no shame. Because there was nothing to be ashamed of. They had a place to live, a job to do, a relationship with God, or might I add, a personal relationship with God. But then in Genesis 3, Satan comes into the garden. And he catches the woman while she's a little isolated away from Adam. And he tempts her and he, he says, what did God really say? God said we couldn't eat of that one tree. Well, it's really not going to hurt you. Yeah, but God said if we ate of that tree, we're going to die. And Satan says, you're not going to die. If I could take a little liberty of that, he's just saying that. You're not going to die. God just don't want you to eat of that tree because if you eat of that tree, you're going to be like him. And Eve looks at the fruit and it looks like all the fruit from the, all the other trees. So she takes and she eats of that fruit. And then she gives it to Adam, and he eats of it as well. And look at Genesis 3, verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Two things real quick. The eyes of both of them were open. Not their physical eyes. They had not been walking around blind. When Scripture says the eyes of both of them were open, it means suddenly the emotional, the mental, the spiritual was completely open. And suddenly they both knew they were, here's that word again, naked. Not physically. They already well knew they were physically naked. Suddenly they knew they were naked before God. And they knew and realized in that moment that that nakedness made them vulnerable. Because for the first time, they had something to hide. So scripture says they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Have you ever asked where they got the thread? Any of you catch that? Where'd they get the thread to sew the fig leaves together? That's, that's just a head joke. They sewed fig leaves together. Obviously, this is a temporary solution to a permanent problem. Because if you know anything about fig leaves, and within about two or three, four days, those fig leaves are going to dry up and fall off. And they'd be right back to square one. And here's the thing I want you to hear. 
all of man's solutions to the problem of sin are just that, a temporary cover-up. They're not a solution at all. They're just a cover-up. They're an effort to hide our nakedness and our shame. And this in chapter 3, verse 7, is the beginning of shame. This verse says that their eyes were open, the eyes of their conscience, and they immediately recognized that disobeying God was an irreversible mistake. Their shameful or shame-filled response was to try and cover their sin when in reality their proper response would have been to immediately shout it out and call and ran straight to God it's an interesting study of the book of a couple of books but the life of King David because if you study the life of David, David was a guy that just he, just, he just kept making mistakes, tripping over his own feet. But yet he was described as a man after God's own heart. And here I believe is why. When you study the life of David, you'll find that every time David really messed up, he immediately ran to God and said, God, I messed up. I need help. But Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves. And that is exactly what sin and shame do. They deceive us and they cause us to withdraw and to hide from God. Then in verse 8, chapter 3, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where are you? By the way, God or Jesus, they never ask a question they didn't already know the answer to. Jesus would ask questions not so that he would gain knowledge, but so the person he was asking would gain knowledge. Where are you? And Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. Why was he afraid? Because I was naked. Now he was created naked. Why now is he afraid because he's naked? I was naked and I hid myself. Verse 11, and he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you that you should not eat? And he got silent. The greatest fear of man is the fear of rejection. Let me say that again. The greatest fear of man is the fear of rejection. That fear is directly tied to shame. And that fear and the shame that creates that fear is the is the source of all of our insecurities. Let's get personal a little bit. You know that every single one of us here has some insecurities? If I were in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with any of you and I would say, hey, good to meet you. My name's Greg. Hey, can I ask you a question? You'd probably say, sure. Hey, can you give me a list of all your insecurities? 
the chances are you and I would not really jump out to a great friendship. Because we don't like to talk about those things. In fact, we don't even like to think about those things. And I sure don't want to have to admit those things. But the source of all the insecurities we deal with in life is tied back to the fear of rejection which comes out of shame. When I say insecurities, I don't, I don't, I don't just I mean in the insecurities we feel in our human relationships, the insecurity that I might have in my relationship with God, the insecurity I may even feel about eternity. I've had a lot of people over the years I would say as a pastor to them, can I ask you this? Like, we all know that Jesus is coming again one day and our time on earth will be over and then after that it's going to be eternity. And my only question to you is, are you ready? You know what the most common answer that I've gotten over the years? Preacher, I hope so. I hope so. Can I tell you out of love that if that's your answer, I hope so, that that means I've got some insecurities about that. Like I think I've done more good than I have bad. But I'm not sure. If that's what you're thinking, let me tell you, you should have some insecurities about that. Because that's not what it takes. Insecurities in the marriage relationship. See, here's what happened. Their eyes were open and they suddenly realized they were naked. You know, they were better off when they didn't know that they needed to hide stuff from each other or from God. But somehow we grow up in, I'll just say, in America, and we're kind of taught that, you know, we ought to have this perfect marriage. But yet, because of our own insecurities, which come way out of our deep-seated fear of rejection, because of shame, wherever that came from in our own personal life, there are things that we try to cover up and hide. That's exactly what Adam and Eve are trying to do in their relationship with God. Which brings me to a word where I really want you to think with me for a few minutes. And it is the word intimacy. Because what was lost in the moment that they partook of that forbidden fruit and they disobeyed the very word of God, command of God, is Adam and Eve suddenly lost intimacy with God. And they knew it. They immediately knew it. They immediately realized that that intimate time songwriter wrote a song about it that we've sang all our lives if you've been in church. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. Remember that? In the garden? Remember the chorus? And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I'm one of his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there None other has ever known. And suddenly that is gone. I heard that word intimacy for many years. But I struggled to be able to define it because everybody seemed to have a different kind of slant on it. And I heard other preachers that would preach sermons about intimacy but they never even explained what that was. They just said, you ought to have it. But a few years back, I ran across this definition. I don't know who to credit it to. But it says this. It says, true intimacy is to be fully known and know that you are fully loved. Think that through with me. To be fully known and know 
No doubt about it. You know that you are fully loved. In other words, let's go back to naked. It's not a perfect illustration, but naked. Okay, here I am, God. What you see is what you get. Here I am in all my glory. And in all my failure. And in all my insecurity. And in all my shame. And in all my failures and mess ups. Here I am. Fully known. And in that moment. I've taken a risk on just becoming completely naked because I have this fear of rejection. But in that moment when I am willing to be fully known, suddenly I realize, maybe for the first time in my life, that I am fully loved. Unconditional. See, I have this feeling that if, if you knew everything about me, there would surely be something that would cause you to say, ha, ah, I don't want to be friends with him. As husband and wife, we think if he or she knew everything, they would probably say, There's, if I had known that, I'd have never married you in the first place. Or... Now that I know that, I'm done. Because we have this tremendous fear deep-seated in us of rejection. And it all comes out of shame, which started with sin. But intimacy is to be fully known and know without any doubt that you are fully loved. And when sin entered God's creation in Genesis chapter 3, that is what was destroyed. And suddenly, when intimacy was lost, there became a barrier between God and man. A barrier in the relationship between God and man. And that nakedness that transparency, that wide openness, that nothing to be ashamed of was gone. And Adam and Eve, the only thing they could think to do was we got to hide this. Now, you and I, we, many of you have been in church your whole life, so you, you kind of look around and go, well, you can't hide anything from God. Yeah, but you weren't the first man and woman that were ever here. Like, you hadn't read the Bible. You, you do know that they, they didn't even have a Bible, right? You know that? Yeah, hello? Like, don't argue whether they read the King James, the NIV, or whatever. They didn't have a Bible. They didn't read the Bible. Shame on them. All they had was a personal relationship with God that was unhindered. You know that most people, even married couples, never achieve true, full intimacy because they are convinced that if they get completely naked, completely honest and transparent with God are completely honest and transparent with their spouse that there would be something about their life that would cause God to reject them or cause their spouse to reject them. So young man and young woman start dating. For us it was 18 years old. That's way too young. For serious. But we did. We got married on my 19th birthday. Darla was 18. She married an older man. Young man, young lady start dating. Here's what I know they do. 
for every date, he tries to show his best side. And she tries to show her best side. Right? How of that has read, read sayings like, you never know what somebody's lived like till you live with them. So young people say, okay, well, we'll just live together then before we get married. I read one a few what months ago, and it said this. It said, you want to know what somebody's really like? Sit in, sit in traffic at a standstill for an hour with them. Then you'll find out if they're marriage material or not. Many people go through life never experiencing complete intimacy because they are so afraid of being rejected that they never get, quote, naked before God or naked before whoever they're in a human relationship with. Now hear my heart. That is why so many people have experienced a religious or an emotional experience that simply did not last or cannot be sustained. Let's talk about unconditional love. Here's the problem. We have nothing to compare it to. You know, that's one of the ways that you learn and understand things is by comparison. Like We call that high because we know what low is. We say someone goes fast because we understand what? slow looks like. We understand hot because we have a reference called cold. We know what kind looks like because we know what unkind looks like. It's, it's our human nature. It's part of the way God wired us. It's part of the way we, we learn, the way our brain works. We, we learn through comparison. We teach our kids through comparison. And with unconditional love, because we cannot compare it to something, we struggle to, to understand it or to, or to grasp it or to accept it. In my mind, this is the closest I think we come on, here on earth. Um, we have two daughters, grown adult daughters now. But I remember... You know, going through pregnancy, Darla carrying those girls for nine months in each case. Then the hospital experience of birthing the girls. And I was there in the room, not sure why, but I was there in the room when she had both of them. And, you know, during those nine months, it's, we're laying in bed. And after we got over all the morning sickness stuff and all, but we're laying in bed. And as they get to the age where they start kicking in the womb and, She'll say, ooh, put your hand right here. You can feel it, you know. I mean, as a dad, you get so excited. Here's the thing. Both mom and dad love that child from the moment you discover she's pregnant. You don't know if it's a boy or a girl. You don't know anything about them. But you just immediately love them, right? And your love grows, if it's possible, for the whole nine months. And that moment when that child is finally born, and the doctor takes that child out of a mother's womb and he cuts the cord and they wipe that child up and then just for a minute or two, they take that child and lay that child on a mother's chest. You with me? Got that picture? If you can just stand back for a second and capture that moment, the emotions that that mother feels in that moment I think it's about the closest we can ever come to understanding unconditional love on a human basis. Does that dad love that baby? Absolutely. To, to the degree he's capable, of, he does. But there's something different because that mother carried that child inside of her for nine months. 
There's just something, I'm sorry, dads, but there's something that mom has an edge right there. And I, I think that's about as close as we can come humanly to understanding unconditional love. But when God says, I love you unconditionally, I, it doesn't matter what you've done. But God, I've disobeyed you. I understand that. So did my first child. But God, I did exactly what you told me not to do. I know you did. I watched it. And it broke my heart. But God, I, I not only hurt you, but I hurt other people too. In my sin. God said, I know, I cried. I wept. And kind of like the prodigal son, you go back and you say, but I'm not even worthy to be forgiven. God says, I know. But you don't grasp how much I love you. I love you so much that I let my only son go to earth and, and shed his blood and die so that you could be forgiven and have real life again. The kind of life you were created to have before Genesis 3 and sin ever happened. Where you were naked, felt no shame, and were in a perfect right relationship with me. Because we cannot explain unconditional love, because we struggle to have anything to compare it to, we also struggle to believe it and to really fully accept it. But there must come a moment in time where you realize and sin that not only have you, you realize and accept that not only have you sinned against a holy, perfect God, a God who created you to live a shameless, sinless, eternal life in relationship with Him. There must come a point in time where you realize that God created you for a relationship that was intimate, personal, a relationship where there is true intimacy, nakedness. A relationship where you know that no matter how much you've messed up, no matter how much you've dealt with the fear of rejection or the element of shame, that you know without a doubt that God already fully knows you and He fully loves you. God who says, you can come to relationship with me naked and without shame, and I will accept you. In fact, that's the only way I can accept you. That's why Jesus came and modeled for us how to live, but then gave his life and died on the cross so we could be restored back to the original relationship that Adam and Eve and you and I were created to have. One that is naked, intimate, transparent, wide open, and personal with God. And if you have tried or you have settled for anything less than that, it may be because somewhere and sometime along the way, you have received a vaccine. Now, I, I don't want to get into politics here with COVID-19 and vaccines, but it's such an obvious, easy illustration. You know what a vaccine is? It's just a very, very small dose of something 
designed to help keep you from getting the real thing. And some people have gotten vaccinated maybe even multiple times in different churches across their life. But inside, they still have this sense that there must be more. I just thought living the Christian life and being in relationship with God, would there be more to it than this? Can I say to you, there is more to it than that. Unless or until you understand and are willing to become fully known and fully loved and realize what that means to you, and that becomes personal to you, and unless or until you accept God's unconditional love into your heart and your life, you will, quote, be saved, but then still wrestle with all kinds of insecurities and faint shame and the fear of rejection. And listen, once you know you are fully known and truly believe in your heart that you are fully loved, insecurity, shame, and the fear of rejection has to go. They can't coincide. You will struggle in your prayer life because you'll always feel as if you can't be completely naked or honest with God and really get vulnerable with Him. You will have some level of fear of your own mortality and of the reality of eternity. Last night, something amazing happened. The four cowboys were all in one place at one time. That's hard to do, but we did it last night. And um, sometimes we go a year without all four of us being together, but but we work hard to try to do that, and we did it last night. Sweet time. You wouldn't think four tough old boys would have such a sweet time of fellowship together, but we genuinely love each other. We got in the car to leave. Darla and I got in the car to leave last night she said that was that was such a wonderful time I said it, it more than you know honey because at least two of us it's amazing that we were even alive to be there last night because in the last two years my oldest brother Mike and my youngest brother Roger came within a hair of death I mean a hair of death it could easily be that we could have lost both of them. Easy. But when I walked away from our time together last night, I realized I'm never going to take that for granted. It's too precious to me. It's too precious. And oh, how I wish people felt the same way about their relationship with God. I don't want to spend another day outside of that perfect relationship God created me for. I don't want to live with a fear of rejection. I don't want to carry the burden of shame. I don't want to fear eternity. And there's one more verse I want you to see. It's chapter 3, verse 21. Genesis 3, verse 21. They made sewed fig leaves together and covered themselves. When God saw them, he, he must have just laughed. <laughs> that was great. Let me show you how what unconditional love does. Verse 21, unto Adam also and to his wife. Did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them? That act was very important 
and extremely symbolic. It demonstrated, first of all, that the penalty of sin is death. Where did God get the animal skin to make coverings for Adam and Eve? An animal had to die. Blood had to be shed. And I believe he did that in front of Adam and Eve. I believe they stood there and watched that. I believe God wanted them to fully capture. This is what your sin cost. The second thing that makes it important and symbolic, it is it illustrated that God's sacrificial love when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to willingly sacrifice his life to pay the price for our sins. Why did Jesus come? He came to model for us how to live. And then he died to take our place. He died to pay for our sin. Our sin was covered by the blood of Jesus. And if you're here today as a couple, biblical marriage is designed to mirror the relationship between God and man. One where we're fully known, fully loved. Just like sin destroyed that perfect relationship between God and man, it also calls our insecurity, our shame, our fear of rejection to impact our human relationships beginning with our marriages. That's why Paul would later write that we should be equally yoked. Because Paul knew that the only way we could enjoy, enjoy true intimacy as a husband and a wife would be if both man and woman we're walking in a fully restored relationship with God through personal faith in Jesus Christ. Otherwise, it's impossible for a husband and wife to ever know true intimacy. True intimacy in marriage, by its very nature and based on its creation, can never be achieved outside of genuine intimacy with Jesus Christ. It's impossible. But it all starts with a personal relationship. When I was six years old, almost seven, my two older brothers, Mike and David, got baptized one Sunday night. Pleasant View Baptist Church in Foley, Alabama. I'm sitting there as a six, almost seven-year-old child, and I was a smart kid. And I'm sitting there watching my father baptize Mike and David. And I saw how happy everybody was. And I saw how proud everybody was of Mike and David. Isn't this really special? The preacher's kids. Preacher baptizing his own sons. What a, what a legacy that is. And then my dad preached that night. And I have no idea what he preached about. No idea. But at the end of his sermon, I did what I had watched a few weeks before. I'd watched Mike and David do. I walked down that little aisle, that little six, not quite seven-year-old. I don't have any idea what my dad said to me. He probably said something like, do you realize you're a sinner? Uh-huh. Do you want Jesus to forgive your sins? Uh-huh. Do you want to get baptized? Uh-huh. And a week or two later, guess what? I got baptized, and everybody was proud of me, too. And I spent the next 10 plus years of my life. We were in church every time the doors were open. That wasn't the issue. My dad was as great a preacher as you would have ever heard preach. Heard preach. That wasn't the issue. When I was 17 years old, a man walked up to me, a total stranger. He said, hey, can I ask you a question? 
Now, at 17, I knew it all. Any of you relate? Any of you got one of those? 17, I knew it all. Can I ask you a question? Sure. I'm thinking he wants to know. We're at church, by the way. He want, he's wanting to know where can I find the pastor, where, where's the bathroom. Didn't matter whatever the question was. I, I definitely knew the answer. He said, can I ask you a question? I said, yes, sir. He said, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? where you talk with him, walk with him every day. Before I could catch myself, I told him the truth. I said, no, sir, I don't have that. He didn't know I was a preacher's kid. He didn't know who I was. He said, do you mind if we take a few minutes, let's just sit down right here on the front pew and let me talk about to you about how you can have that? I said, I didn't really want to do it, but I said, no, sir, I don't mind. In about 10 minutes, that man helped open my heart and my eyes to something I had never really understood in 17 years of being in church every time the doors were open. And in about 10 minutes, he said, would you like to pray right now and ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin and come into your life and walk and talk with you for the rest of your life? be in relationship with him? I said, yes, sir, I'd like to do that. He said, well, let's do that right now. We literally knelt at the altar of Olivet Baptist Church in Wilkins Falls. A man named Randall Wise, who was the mayor of Niceville for 40-plus years, just died a couple of years ago, great man. He helped lead me that night to pray and ask Jesus Christ to come into my life. Can I tell you that this is not church talk. This is just Greg being transparent. When I stood up from that altar, I knew right then something was different in me. And that was 47 years ago. Since that time, I've stumbled. I've made some big mistakes. There's a lot of things I do different. I've struggled with my own fears and insecurities and shame, just like you have and maybe some of you are. But then I come back to the garden. And I remember that he knows me fully, and yet he still loves me fully. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me, Greg, you're one of mine. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known because it's personal. Can I ask you to do this with me? Would you just close your eyes for a minute? We're not going to sing an invitation, but I am going to have her play softly in the background. I, I, I want you to have a minute with you and God. Because here's what I, I know. I don't think I know. In this moment, you some of you sat there and you go, that's a pretty good sermon. He, he's a pretty good preacher. He did all right today. Some of you sat there and said, well, I've never quite seen it that way or heard it that way. But that was good. But there might be one or two or a few of you that have sat there and go, now I know why I'm here today. He's talking to me. I've tried the religion thing, but it don't last. I may have even tried the, quote, church thing, but it didn't satisfy. But when he talks about a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, one where I realize God knows me completely and has already made up his mind that no matter what, he still loves me completely. Friend, can I tell you that that's the kind of relationship you were created for? And that's the kind of relationship God just desperately wants to have with you. 
He wants to start that as soon as possible today. And he wants that to be that way forever. That's why we call it eternal life. Listen, do you know that much of the Bible was written about the here and now? You can experience real joy, real victory, real peace. You don't have to wait till one day when you go to heaven. You can experience it here. Through a real, honest, transparent, naked relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, where you understand that I am fully known and I know that I am fully loved. Friend, there's nothing else like that. Yes, it's hard to grasp sometimes because I don't have anything good to compare it to. It's better than how much my mama loved me. It's better than how much my wife loved me. It's better than how much my grandkids loved me. It's better than that. And I can rest in that. I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to worry about being rejected. It's guaranteed to me if I will just receive it, accept it. So I'm going to pray in and in a minute. I'm just going to be here at the front. If you want to come and you want to talk with me, or there's, I know some of the leaders of this church will be available as well. You may want to just come and kneel at the altar and have some time with God. But if God's drawing you today, do not reject and walk away from that invitation. Make it personal, make it real good today. Father, I pray for every single person that's in this building. No matter how long we've been in church, no matter what titles or positions we've ever held, or no matter how much we may be worried about what other people might think, that I pray that not a man or a woman can walk out this door today without knowing and they've had the opportunity to say yes to a relationship with you. Through the sacrifice and victory on the cross and the resurrection of the tomb, they can have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. They can have it today. And it's, it will last forever. Lord, our hearts long for true intimacy to be fully known full, know we're fully loved to be completely wide open transparent, naked before you and know that you love us unconditionally now in the quietness of this moment God will you speak and will you draw us to you however you choose that to be publicly or privately while we wait, you speak right now. Again, heads bowed, eyes closed. Not for anybody but you. What would God have you do?
for the joy to just share with you today. Thank you for the way you've loved on my brother and Lisa. Uh, know the way they love back on you. I've told pastors before, every pastor deserves one David Kale in his ministry. And um, you know, I've said that to him too. I mean, I love him. I love him. His heart for the Lord, his heart for church. But he always loves the pastor too. So I know he's been a blessing to y'all. Thank y'all for being a blessing to them, too. Um, Ronnie, you going to close? Who's going to close? Amen. If there's one thing you could take with you when you leave this service today, understand this. He said something right there at the end of that message that's been kind of a core principle for my walk with God since I came back and got right with God, and that's make it personal. Because nobody can live for God for you. It's up to you. And we need to desire a truly intimate and open relationship with God. Because even though God can see everything, it doesn't mean that we understand that and get that all the time because we still try to hide things just like Adam 
But it doesn't matter what we try to hide from God. He knows us into the deepest depths of who we are because He created us. So as we leave this place today, we're going to have prayer. And I want to ask um, some of our prayer warriors, if you would, to come up this way. I want to pray for Sister Lucinda Mitchell. I've got an anointing cloth over here. We want to have her come up. And we want to pray and ask for her sister that God would just move in that situation. Yeah, if we can have some people come up here, we want to pray and anoint these prayer cloths. Sometimes it's easy to underestimate what a little piece of cloth can do. as we're praying, we just want to ask that for every person in here, that God would minister to every need that may exist within our hearts and lives. Any doubt, God, just have your way. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord God, for this service. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you for your every blessing that you've ever poured out upon our lives that we can never earn or deserve. God, we ask that you would just continue to be with us, that your base mercy and your goodness would continue to follow us every step that we would take. God, as we leave this place today, this morning, Lord, for the service, continue to allow your presence to, to go with us and to lift us up, to strengthen us, and empower us. 
God, I pray once more these prayer calls. Let your will be done and let your presence go forth in your anointing flow. In Jesus' name we thank you and we give you praise, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Can we just give the Lord some praise? God is good. One more prayer request. Um, Sister Sonia had put it on group me about Hannah. Jeff and Amy, and they were members of this church, and they taught Sunday school. And what some people don't know is when we first come here, we were going to buy a house, and we asked for prayer that God would make a way for us to buy our house. And when it come down to it, when we got our money for the down payment, we were about... $2,000 short. And Jeff come to us and said, when we asked for prayer during Sunday school, God laid it on his heart to start saving up money. They did not know how much was going to need it, and we didn't know how much was going to need it. They gave us the exact amount of money that we needed to make our down payment on our house. Hannah now, their daughter, is over there in a situation in Bangladesh, and she's trying to come home today. And we need to keep them in their in our prayers so they can come home. She's over there doing the Lord's work and missionary work, trying to witness and further his kingdom, and they're trying to come home with all that going on over there. So if you please just pray again for her. Hannah Morris is her name. Her and her team, and there's another team that's over there trying to come home today. We want to pray for them. They're, as she said, they're doing God's work. We really don't know how good we have it here. Because we have the freedom to come together and join together as a congregation and lift up the name of the Lord. But there are places all over the world and they're witnessing it right now. That persecution is real. That people are losing their lives for the name of the Lord. And they're being exposed to a situation right now that has the potential to be really bad or really good. I believe the scripture when it says that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord who are called according to His purpose. And they are there for His purpose. So we want to pray that God would not only bring them home safely, but He would use the situations that they've experienced and gone through in a positive way to further the cause of the kingdom of God. Because it was during great persecution at the beginning of the church in the book of Acts that when Stephen's death came about, that the church grew and exploded. Through bad times, good things come. And through storms, sunrises break through. And even in the worst and through the potentially worst situations, God will always make a way. So we want to pray for them before we leave. Dear God, we thank you. the Lord. You are dismissed in the name of the Lord. Feel free to fellowship together. Just uh, tell somebody that you love them.